Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Sheila Bauman, and I'm the events planner for Kitchener Public Library. I'm pleased to welcome you to tonight's event. Before we begin the program, I would like to start with a territorial acknowledgement. As we gather, we are reminded that the library is situated on land that is the traditional home of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and neutral people. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. We also recognize the contributions Indigenous peoples have made in shaping and strengthening this community. We are grateful for the opportunity to meet here and reaffirm our collective commitment to make the promise and challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our community. I want to welcome you and thank you for attending our fall 85 Queen Author events. It's a part of the City of Kitchener's Imagine It series of programs and events. At this time, I would like to introduce and then invite Lisa Drew to the screen. She will then introduce tonight's 85 Queen special guest. And following the introduction, Lisa Unger will do a short reading from her book. Then Lisa Drew will join her on screen for a conversation. Lisa Drew is co-anchor of the 570 Morning News and Morning Managing Editor for the City News 570. Recent honors include the Cambridge WYCA Women of Distinction Award, and Edward R. Murrow Awards for Best Newscast and for, for her series on sex trafficking in Waterloo Region. Lisa is a proud supporter and volunteer with United Way. She also serves as MC for a number of charity and women's events locally. Lisa teaches radio news and advanced radio news reporting at Conestoga College. You can follow Lisa on Twitter and Instagram at Lisa Drew Radio. There you will keep up on both her professional role and her farm, her gardens, and her shenanigans as a goat and a duck mom. Lisa was previously interviewer for our 85 Queen series when she chatted with Kathy Reichs back in April 2020, when we moved our events online. I'm thrilled to welcome Lisa back to KPL for tonight's book launch. Hi, Lisa. Nice to see you. Thank you, Sheila, and welcome. And uh, what a great night to talk to two Lisas. Uh, I think we're going to overload Matt behind the scenes here as we go back and forth with two leases. I'm thrilled to return. I sort of feel like this is our uh, pandemic 2.0 tour. Uh, shortly after the lockdown, we started this uh, incredible bit online with KPL, and I'm thrilled to be back tonight to talk to Lisa Unger and uh, introduce her as well this evening as we get the uh, event started. Um, thank you again for including me, Sheila and Mary. I'm thrilled to be back with the 85 Queen event and also a chance to chat with Lisa Unger tonight. Uh, I feel like I've become fast friends with Lisa. She's now on my radar in a bigger way. And boy, do I have a lot of reading to do in the weeks to come. There's so many more books I have to uh, read from Lisa. Now, Lisa Unger is a New York Times and internationally best-selling author. Incredible numbers I'm going to put out here with books published in 30 languages and millions of copies sold worldwide. She is widely regarded as a master of suspense. Lisa's critically acclaimed novels have been featured on best book lists from the Today Show, Good Morning America, Entertainment Weekly, People, Amazon, Goodreads, and so many more. She's been nominated for or won numerous awards, including the Strand Critics, the Hammett Prize, ITW Thriller, and Goodreads Choice, and in 2019, she received not one, but two Edgar Award nominations, an honor held only by a few authors, including um, Agatha Christie, you might have heard of her. Uh, her short fiction has been anthologized in the Best American Mystery and Suspense, and her nonfiction has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, NPR, and also Travel and Leisure. It's uh, graving me Great uh, thrill to introduce her tonight as we talk about her most recent novel. It is just out a few weeks ago, already getting a ton of buzz, making a lot of lists, and that is The Last Girl Ghosted, just released uh, October 5th. It's already a USA Today bestseller. And by the way, you need to follow Lisa on social media. I am having so much fun with her on social media as well and just tracking where she's going and what she's talking about. Find Lisa Unger on Twitter at Lisa Unger and on Insta, cool kids call it, Instagram at L Unger. I look forward to our chat tonight with another Lisa and I'm thrilled to welcome now Lisa Unger to KPL. Welcome Lisa. 
Thanks for having me. I'm so excited, so excited to be here. Thanks to the Kitchener Library and also Lisa. I I feel like we're friends now, like BFFs forever, because I'm always like sort of um, seeing you on social media. So it's great to be able to chat with you. You can't yeah. go wrong with Elisa, right? Right. I mean, I think that's really <laughs> true. <laughs> so I'll just start off with a. I'll start off with a just a brief little reading, and then uh, hopefully we can get to hang out a little bit and chat. So yeah, I'm going to read from great. a little bit from uh, chapter one of my new novel, Last Girl Ghosted. Modern dating. Let's be honest. It sucks. Is there anything more awkward, more nervous making than waiting for a person you've only seen online to show up in the flesh? This was a mistake. The East Village bar I'm in is crowded and overwarm with too many bodies, manic with too many television screens, the din of voices, somewhere music trying in vain to be heard over the noise. I'm early, which has me feeling awkward and waiting on something I'm not sure I wanted in the first place. I started off standing by the door, half planning to leave, then finally made my way into the fray and slipped into an open place at the bar. And here I sit on an uncomfortable stool, waiting. I should go. My order of a seltzer water has earned me the indifference of the pretty tattooed bartender with the hot pink hair and magnetic eyelashes and she hasn't been back since briskly placing the tumbler in front of me. She has a point. There's no reason to come to a place like this, a hipster watering hole at happy hour, unless you've come to have a drink. One certainly doesn't come for the atmosphere, but it's important to keep a clear head. I've never been here before. My best friend Jack suggested it, an old haunt of hers. Crowded, she said. Anonymous. Safer to meet a stranger in a crowd, right? Safer not to meet a stranger at all, had been my reply. A worried frown. And then what? Never meet anyone? Would that be so bad? Solitude? It's not the worst thing in life. It was Jax's idea, the whole online dating thing. Robin, my childhood friend, who is basically Jax's opposite, was against it. Love, she said, is not an algorithm. Truth. Anyway, who's looking for love? Only everyone. Robin would surely say. I take a sip of my icy sparkling water and glance at the door. A roar of laughter goes up from the big group at the table in the back. I keep my eyes on them for a moment, watching. Three women, four men, young, well-heeled, coiffed and polished, co-workers maybe, relaxed, easy, comfortable, the opposite of how I feel. I notice that my shoulders are hiked up. I force myself to relax, breathe, the man beside me is uncomfortably close, his shoulder nudging up against mine twice, now three times. Is he doing it on purpose? I turn to see. He's bulky, balding, a sheen of sweat on his brow. No, he's not even aware of me. He's on his phone, scrolling through pictures of women. It's that other app, Firestarter, the one just for hookups. It tells you who is in your vicinity looking for a brief, no strings connection. There are people all around him. An attractive brunette alone at the end of the bar, also staring at her phone. A group of young girls, students judging from the new school sweatshirt and the pitcher of beer at a high top right behind him. He is on his second scotch, at least, I determined by the empty glass next to his full one. But he just keeps scrolling through the images on his phone, looking and looking strange. The world has become a very strange place. I feel like we were in the bar with you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> with that friend that you so want to find that perfect guy for. But yeah. we already know <laughs> that there's something something going on. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I mean, and they do have, you know, Ren and Jax do have like a kind of special friendship, you know, and and Jax, you know, Ren comes from this kind of dark place, this dark past, but she's created this life in the light. You know, she's, um, you know, she's dedicated to helping other people and maybe not as dedicated to helping herself or looking into her own heart. And so Jax kind of, I think, sees that. And that's why she pushes Ren into the world of online dating, which is, you know, the way of it these days. 
And it, it seems like everyone's doing it. And then some of us, are, you know, we're there rooting for our friends, but we're so aware of the dangers that can happen. And you've led us down that path so quickly. And then, you know, you're giving us little, little pieces as we go, as we learn more about, you know, our Ren and, and we, we learn more about how she evolves from Robin. And then also Dear Birdie, where, you know, it's don't you get tired of helping others and solving other people's problems. And then we realize all the problems that she's going to bring and share with us throughout this, this journey uh, of your story. Um, how did you come up with when you look at Robin, Wren, and Birdie, all three sweet, sweet bird names, but they all represent so many different things. I was taking notes on what they represented. I even did like a chart. Oh, um, when I was reading, you know, and I thought there, there's Robin described as a feral girl, you know, real to me in Ren's voice, constant, um, all you needed um, to survive, according to Dr. Cooper. And then you've got Ren, who's, who's our, our, our heroine, who we, we were rooting for, and we're trying to keep safe throughout this story with you. Wild, delicate, stubborn, soft, fierce, you know, she's, she's all these different things. And, you know, she's going down that dark hallway, you want to make her stop as a friend. And then Dear Birdie's there to solve everyone's issues. And even Ren's speaking to Dear Birdie throughout the book. Hey. How did you create, it's such a, it's really three characters, but it, it's all one at the same time. How did you develop that and, and keep it going? You know, it's, it's funny because when I, you know, when my characters show up on the page, I don't, you know, I don't really know that much about them, you know, like things start for me with this, you know, like a seed, a germ. In this case, it was like a conversation that I had with a young friend about online dating, you know, mm -hmm. and I had this conversation with her where we talked about for her, the sort of the anxiety and the stress of it, how she had to just, you know, she's like, there's just this endless pool of choices, you know, and you can just swipe and swipe and swipe and it's the next one and the next one and she asked me like how do you know how do you ever know if you picked the right one and you know i was like it just impressed me as being like you know not the right question you know <laughs> like a bro almost like a broken question it's like you're not looking for a toaster you know you're not comparing reader, you're not comparing reviews on Amazon for the best toaster. Love is, you know, love is a head trip, you know, uh, as Robin says, it's not an algorithm. And so, you know, like I had this kind of idea and then there's a bunch of research that follows, um, you know, just sort of a deep dive into online dating and just learning everything I can about it. And this is like sort of how it works for every book. And then I start to hear a voice or voices. And so I don't really know that much about my characters when they show up on the page. And so I didn't know um, Ren, you know, my characters come with their names. Obviously these are all bird names. And I, and to be honest, it was not intentional. <laughs> I am like, I have like an ongoing bird obsession. I have bird themes that like sort of run through, I think my whole body of work, but very specifically the last, you know, five books, I would say you could probably pick up a few major bird themes in, in all of them. And so, you know, and she is so Ren, she evolved for me on the page much in the same way that, you know, she does for my readers. You know, I learned about her in layers. And so the only thing I knew about her was that she came from darkness, you know, that she'd had some kind of serious trauma in her past and that she created this life and she created this other self, this dear, this dear birdie, and that she uses it like, you know, she feels that she is, you know, she's come through trauma and she feels she can lead other people through the darkness into the light. But I think like in, in a lot of sense, senses, it, you know, it keeps her from examining her own heart, her own problems. And, and she does, she does connect with, you know, she does speak to Dear Birdie a lot in the book. Like what would Dear Birdie say? It's like, you know, as we all do try to connect, I guess, with our higher self, with the self of us that, you know, the self that, you know, gives a great advice to our best friend and mm -hmm. doesn't take that same advice in our own lives. I think we can all relate to that. Um, and I'm being conscious. So tell me what the rules are here, because this is such a new book. We're not giving yeah. away endings or spoiler alerts here. Yeah. But, um, you know, I want to make sure I'm not saying the wrong thing, because <laughs> you have to read it and take that journey. Um, 
but I'm going to go to a present day post that you did on Instagram when you talked, um, you wrote an article for Good Housekeeping, yeah. your GH article, where you talked about darkness and trauma and yeah. why you write. And you, you told a great story about, you know, you could be in line at Starbucks and you were dazing, you know, kind of going off into space <laughs> and you're thinking about a terrible thing to write about a book, you know, in, in your book or something that could happen to a character or what would happen if that happened. Um, and you, I can always see you already developing either for your next character or how you kind of plotted out where Ren was going or not going to go next. Is that mm -hmm. kind of how this all develops as well? Waiting in line for that PSL? You know? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, like I, I, it's funny, the article was kind of inspired by this thing that happens to me a lot. Like I'll show up places like books, you know, bookstores or libraries and, you know, people will kind of be looking at me and, I'll start chit chatting and we'll wind up talking about kids or labradoodles or whatever it is that people talk about when they get together and uh, and inevitably somebody will just kind of go you know you seem so nice you know you <laughs> seem so so normal and i'm like oh i am nice <laughs> i i am sort of i am sort of normal you know and it's like part of it has to do with the fact that you know m the person who sits down to write you know, is not necessarily the same person who get who gets up to go sit on car line or like pick up a you know frappuccino or whatever at Starbucks. You know, the, there's a there's a little bit of a dissonance between the those two parts of me. But you know, like I I, I feel like I you know I turn to thrillers or have always turned to this type of writing to kind of metabolize darkness you know the darkness I perceive in the world the things that I'm curious about some of them are very dark you know and they have been since you know I, I mentioned in the article when I was um when I was in high school a girl that I knew was abducted mm -hmm. and murdered and it was a very small town, you know, it was like one of the, it's like, it was a town where nothing bad ever happens, right? It was the place where you move your family from the city, from New York City to be safe. And so when this horrible thing happened, you know, it rocked the whole place, you know, and uh, this terrible tragedy, this loss of this beautiful young girl, this devastating tragedy for the family, and then for for all of us as well. And I do in my, you know, I do tend to look at that moment as like, the world was one thing before that happened. And it was another thing after that happened. And I had a lot of questions. And there were questions that people like didn't want to answer, or they don't even know the answers, right? Or they you know, certainly don't want to have those kind of conversations with a 15 year old girl. And so I kind of found my answers to things on the page in the pages of books and in the pages of the things that, that I was writing, like it was my way to kind of order the chaos that I perceived in the world. And so like, that's sort of how I evolved as a, I think, as I evolved as a crime fiction writer. So kind of like author therapy, maybe. Yeah. Exactly. It's like, psychi you know, you talk to any psychologist or psychiatrist, they'll tell you they could probably came to the work because of things they were dealing with in their own life. Same with like, you know, Dear Birdie, you know, you turn to this, this role as like the advice columnist. And that too is like, comes from, you know, the stuff that you had to work out for yourself. And so I think that, you know, very much so that that's the case for me. So how much research do you do? Do you, do you follow around an advice columnist? Or I know <laughs> at the back of your book, you were giving credit to learning about some wildlife when you talk about, you know, we're on the, I'm going to call it the family farm, but when they're on that, you know, they're living off the grid and she's learning yes. things with her father, how to hunt and, and survival yes. tactics. Where, where do you, like how much research and how much time do you spend, you know, doing all the sidebar stuff before you can kind of plow back into your story? Yeah, I feel like re I feel like reading, learning, researching, and writing is kind of like a continuum for me. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing is always informing the next thing. Like, so I'm writing and I might be researching at the same time, or I'm researching because I'm obsessed about something, and then I start writing, or I read about something else, and it's something that I'm like, oh, I'm going to learn about that later, and it's kind of like this continuum for me, like every, you know, there's not, it's nonstop research for me, like it's part, it's part of my, it's part of the passion and the joy of writing for me is just, you know, on, you know, I'm like kind of an information junkie, like a news junkie, and like a, 
you know, pot, podcasts and all kinds of nonfiction books and psychology texts. And I think one of the books that I, I credit in here is like the art of, you know, um, tracking, tracking and seeing. Like I started reading that book just because I was like, That's so, it's such an interesting idea, you know, that some people can look at things that you would look at and see nothing and they see, you know, all this information. And so like, I was just kind of interested in how people train themselves to see that way. And that what kind of person is able to do it and like the presence that it takes to be able to do something like that. And so like, I was just interested in that, you know, as a, just a curiosity. And so I didn't necessarily at that time know how it was going to find its way into the work, but it, it did eventually. And then I, I read another book about, um, written by this uh, journalist about how people, uh, how people disappear. Mm -hmm. how people are able to you know um they they do this thing called pseudocide you know they fake their fake their own death and disappear and all the different ways in which they're able to do that and what it takes now in this modern world to you know to slip into another identity or to create a, f a fake profile on the internet for yourself to create a fake history and how there are people that can do that and so I, you know, again, like all that information was just kind of, you know, I read it just because I was curious about it, but I didn't know how it would find its way into the work. It's the same with travel, different places. Like, I don't know how things are going to turn up, you know, later on, or if I'm writing and there's something I like, you know, occasionally you just kind of run into the stone wall of your own ignorance. You know, you're like, oh, I don't know anything about taxidermy or... <laughs> <laughs> whatever it happens to be and then the next thing you know you're you're learning about taxidermy and I think what's interesting about research is that you know you need to do so much research you know in order to write even one sort of um authentic like line you know like it you have to your research doesn't necessarily belong in your book but you have to know so much to be able to write about anything with any kind of verisimilitude so I don't really see it as like a stop and go or like you know oh I you know I have to research x in order to write y it's just it's like a non-stop process for me Mm -hmm. And I love that. So you've got the modern day, the latest technology where we're learning about the crypto transfers right. and, you know, the dark web, you yeah. know, and, and exactly how in, in this day and age when we're on Twitter and Instagram and we're out there in every way, yeah. you can act, you can try to disappear. But as we learn, Ryan couldn't truly disappear. Right. Um, and then you're taking us really old school to an Austrian poet, Rilke, who yes. I learned a lot about for the first yeah. time. I did not have Rilke on my radar. Tell me how that that romanticism weaved in with all this technology. Yeah, I mean, I'm always interested in that duality, you know, like the thing that interests me about technology and online dating and social media and stuff like that. It's not so much the technology that that fascinates me. It, it's what, what fascinates me is how it rewrites the way we relate to each other. Right. And, um, you know, so there's that, so there's that real duality in Ren between, you know, um, her modern life, you know, which is all tech to this place in her past, you know, where her father was a, you know, was a, do was a doomsday prepper and a collapsist, meaning that, you know, he believed that the world had already ended and humanity just hadn't figured it out yet, which may, <laughs> may or may, may or may not be true. And, uh, and they, you know, that duality between her modern life and this place where she went, which was a place of trauma and pain and fear for her, but also a place of great beauty, you know, and a place where she learned all these skills um, to be uh, to to be the person that she became, and those skills, in fact, later in the book, you know, without giving anything away, mm -hmm. are you know what she relies on to to save herself, and it is um, you know so that those kind of duality that thread and Rilke is, is a poet that I have been reading since I was you know since I was a kid, and he it kind of pops up again and again in my life and in different ways. And he's like one of those poets that, you know, I kind of go back to. And every time I go back to it, it's different, you know, because I'm different, you know, I'm 
when you first read Rilke, you're just kind of amazed at the beauty of his language. And then for me, as I got older, you know, and I realized that, you know, a lot of times people extract Rilke, like, you know, for, you know, um, about what, you know, the, as if he's writing about love, as if he's writing mm -hmm. about romantic love, but in fact, he's not. In fact, he's right, the, those poems are his love letter to God. And it's him writing about how he is experiencing the enormity of the universe, you know, in his very small way. And he has this way of like, sort of taking these really tiny details and, you know, extrapolating it into sort of gigantic um, themes. And so, you know, it's a very, you know, uh, very like, sort of romantic and and beautiful and deep poetry you know that like has always kind of moved me and uh, again not intentional that it would show up in the book but it just sort of was like some of those themes like that nature versus the world and god versus you know like it, you know man etc like all those big themes um kind of wove their way into the book as well I'm a romantic, so I was still happy that, you know, I was still hopeful for her, you know, I was, kind of felt like we were one of her good friends along for this journey and trying to, you know, help her and keep her safe. And um, there were still those little pockets of, oh, if something's going to happen here, she actually yeah. might find love somewhere along the way out of all this other stuff going on in her life. Um, so, so, you know, I guess that, that tied in as well um, as we jumped from, you know, the romanticism of the poetry and his his letters and how that fit in, but also there was still some hope as well. And, and that, that love, as, even though we're talking about being ghosted, right. that there was still some hope and, and, you know, we hope along that journey that something's going to happen. So, so you kept us going that way as well too, with that emotional pull and the thriller pull as well. Oh, thank you. I love that. Yeah. I mean, the, and that's really, you know, there's a lot of like sort of um, you know, again, that d duality, you know, between the like sort of the thriller aspect, but, you know, the, some of the bigger themes are about, you know, about love and forgiveness and, you know, choosing, choosing the world, you know, the world, it, you know, is in trouble, it is on fire, but like, unlike Ren's father, you know, who wanted to escape mm -hmm. the world and, and go away from it and be away from it, you know, Ren, wonders if there's a be if there's a better choice like you know maybe you don't get to leave you know you you have to stay and fight for the people that you've chosen and fight for whatever is going to be in the world as we move forward into very you know very uncertain times and so mm -hmm. that's a you know that and that's something i think i mean when i look back at my like sort of reading life my reading history you know i've always been like this literary omnivore, you know, like I have just read wildly across, you know, genres since I was a kid, you know, like, so I could be as moved by, you know, Charlotte Bronte and Jane Austen as I might be by like Sidney Sheldon and BC mm -hmm. Andrews, you know, and so like, I feel like Truman Capote is like where I fell in love with language. But like Stephen King is probably, you know, one of my all all, all time favorite writers, you know, just just as he, you know, he's like, you know, an icon. And um, so I have these like wild tastes, like, you know, if you were to ask me like what my favorite books of the last five years are, I would say The Goldfinch, you know, mm -hmm. by Donna Tartt. I might say Game of Thrones, you know. You know, like any kind of huge story that like kind of embraces like some of the bigger, bigger themes. And you can find that everywhere. You can find it in science fiction. You know, you can find it in stories like The Handmaiden's Tale. You can find it, you know, in like Carolyn Kepnes, you know, um, the author of You, it's a, which is adapted to Netflix. And you, like you can find like these incredible voices and like these big stories and these big themes. And you just, you can find it in any, any type of write any type of writing. And so like, I feel like my love of just story, like big story, like Star Wars or like whatever, you know, like I have all these like sort of romantic classical influences and then all these really like pop influences as well, you know, and I feel like that, you know, kind of sometimes comes out in the work a little bit. How does the pandemic influence you? 
Um, do you have something in the works now? How is this impacting you as a writer and uh, just, you know, day to day when we look back now that we're almost two years in? Yeah, um, it doesn't. It's crazy to think that this is where we are. But is that inspiration for you for your next book? Yeah. So, I mean, actually, I wrote Last Girl Ghosted during the pandemic that this was the and I wrote constantly during the pandemic. I know a lot of my writer pals had a really hard time you know, focusing and writing. And uh, it was, you know, a struggle, you know, not just with kids home, but just like the mm -hmm. idea that, you know, the world is burning and what am I doing? I'm in here writing a book. But for me, that's where I go, you know, like that's where I go to metabolize darkness. Like it's an escape hatch for me. And I, I've always gone there, like even in, you know, the darkest periods of my, of my own personal life, you know, like that's where I go to get, to get through, to get through. And it was no different, um, during the pandemic. Like I still got up in the morning and, and, and worked and did my writing detective just walk across. <laughs> He's doing great. He's He's such an right? He's such an <laughs> Um, are you the type of writer where you literally set the clock and from nine to five, I go in and shut the door and say goodbye to my family? Or will you wake up two in the morning and say, oh, I have to write? Like, what's what's more you? Or has that changed with the pandemic as well? Yeah, I mean, I am always like my golden creative hours are from 5 a.m. to noon. Like that is my that is my most powerful creative time. And so you, when my daughter was tiny, you know, she was also a really, really early riser. So. I would be getting up at like four o'clock in the morning and then I would try to get as much writing done as I could before she woke up. And then, you know, um, then, you know, as she got older, it was like the same, get up early, try to get as much writing done before she wakes up, then get her to school and then come back. And as her, as her life has evolved, sort of my writing life has evolved to be like, I write on basically on her schedule. Like, so for a long time, she like didn't even think I had a job. <laughs> Most kids don't think we have jobs, right? No, they don't think, they're like, you're, whatever, you're just the mom. You're like, you don't do anything. And uh, and so that was, you know, um, that's been always my, but morning has always been my deeply creative time. But I do sometimes dream about my work, you know, and I do wake up and it's usually not 2 a.m. It's usually 3 a.m. <laughs> It's usually 3 a.m. Like that's the witching hour, right? Like that's the hour everybody wakes up to like write or to worry or whatever it is. And uh, and so usually if that if that happens, I do get up and work at that time. And then I'm like, you know, a miserable wreck by like four eight, by like four o'clock that afternoon or whatever. But you know, it really has always been the those early, early hours that have been best for me. And then of course, you know, like when you're on deadline or there's, you know, there's that, you know, sort of really intense period towards the end of a book, like it's a complete obsession, like you can't think or about anything else or do anything else. That's really when it's, it's kind of like all the time. And it, my husband and my daughter are kind of like, you know, they know when it has, <laughs> when the storm has come and they're like, okay, mom's got to work. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's okay too. And so it's just kind of a little bit of a balance of, of, of those kind of, you know, the routine, the morning routine, the, like, and that's to say, like, if I don't get those morning hours, because, you know, as moms, we don't always get the hours that we intend or that we intend for that we need. I still work in the afternoon or in the evening or whenever I have to, like, it's not so precious. Like I have to work in the morning or I can't work at all. It's like, I'm going to work no matter what, but it's just, those are the best hours for me. The one I was reading last girl ghosted, I, I can already see this up on the big screen. <gasps> Yeah. Do you know anyone? Make it, can you make well, I was going to say, have you been approached? Have you been involved on the movie side of things? Or, like, or who would you cast? You know, I, would... oh gosh, I don't know. I always have such a hard time with that question. I, I like, cause everybody like, I, I see those characters so clearly. Like, so anybody who is not that character, um, it would be just, other I guess is the word that I'm looking for so I don't know who I don't know who I would cast I don't know who I'm who you, who would you cast as Ren who can you say? um I was and I wouldn't say she's like my number one actress but I don't know why but Dakota Johnson who's dating Coldplay Chris Martin oh okay <laughs> um, I don't know why but she popped into my head 
Um, Jax, I don't know. I was thinking about that and Jones, but I don't know why, but she popped into my head for some weird reason. I haven't been able to come up with a better person at this point. Yeah, I guess if I was Does thinking that about like, with you or like physically, like I guess for Ren, I could think I could see like a Jennifer Lawrence. Mm hmm. You know, she's like, having a baby right now, but she might be ready to do a movie soon. She might be, yeah. We'll yeah. Just give her a call and see how she's feeling. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I could see, you know, I could see like a, a like a a Chris Pine for yes. um, Bailey. Um, but they're all just approx, you know, those are all just approximations of like, you know, it's not like they're so they're so real to me you know like it's just a it's an it's an interesting it's an interesting thing there's you know um yeah there might be some good news to share about something soon and unfortunately i can't share it right now but so i'm trying to get a scoop here can you yeah, tell no, i, I, I want to get the right news first. <laughs> it's like a hard searing like reporter like tell us what's gonna happen i don't know but i you since you're following me in social media, you will be you will be the first you will be among the first to know among the first the big no the big news. <laughs> All right, so that's a big hint. I think we might have almost gotten a, bro a breaking news story. There. Yes, almost, 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 almost. I, we're getting very close to a, a, a point where Sheila's going to open it up where we can take some questions from okay, our great. audience that's joining us. Um, you talked about books that had inspired you, and uh, I noticed that your mom was a librarian. To oh. me. Yes. would be a dream come true um anybody who you know we go to beds with our piles of books and they keep yes. us company like our childhood friend what were yes. you reading as a child and what was your mom bringing home to you yeah so my mom was a you know avid reader uh you know uh, and just a great lover of story you know we were talking about how i was named after lisa is it montgomery yeah lisa montgomery yes. from <laughs> from as the world turns so my mom like just loved any big story you know she's like kind of kind of like me and so she was a big reader and you know like when i look back to my childhood like the kinds of things that i read like of course you know the nancy drews the hardy boys yeah. the Enc encyclopedia brown harriet the spy you know little house on the prairie books like you know all all of that stuff which, by the way, when you read them now to your daughter, like in this more woke moment, some of those things are pretty, sh pretty shocking. <laughs> but anyway, that's another that's another conversation. <laughs> and you're like, wow, I'm going to be editing this um, as we read, and uh, and it's just kind of interesting too that my mom had like, you know, my parents, my dad was like a nonfiction reader. You know, he was an engineer. He just does not, to this day, does not read fiction. You know, he occasionally will read my books, just you know, like on audio, like if he has a long drive or whatever. Um, but like there was always these huge shelves of books, always like his books, my mom's books. And like, there was no censorship for me. Like if I could reach it, I could read it. Nobody was paying attention to what I was reading. And my mom just kind of figured, well, you're gonna get what you get, and then what go what you're what you don't understand is gonna go over your head, and it's fine, it's no big deal. But you know, things were not going over my my head, so I was reading like inappropriately <laughs> and in an inappropriately young age, like things like Sydney Sheldon and uh, V. C. Andrews, like Flowers in the Attic, mm -hmm. and all the Stephen King books I could read, like just I mean. Cujo. I mean, I think I was 12. <laughs> I was just, I remember when Judy Bloom did that crossover to that adult book and there was a big yes. backlash, but we all read that. Oh we yeah. Judy Bloom, yeah. Forget about it. Beverly Cleary. Yeah. You know, like all of those books. And so Judy Bloom, um, just like a little bit of a side note, I had the opportunity to interview her wow. on stage here at the Tampa Bay, um, Tampa Bay Times Festival of Reading. So I got to interview her on stage. My um, Colette Bancroft is the book critic down here at the Tampa Bay Times. And I literally begged her. I was like, please, please let me interview Judy Blue because like, of course that would be her author to interview, right? I was like, just please, just this one time. She's like, okay. And uh, and I was lucky enough to have my daughter. My daughter was in fourth grade at the time, and they were reading Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing, yeah. and they were all, the whole fourth grade was like sitting in the front row as I as I interviewed Judy Bloom, and that was like a very big like 
fangirl like mom moment it was like super cool and you forget i mean you are an author the impact that you have on our lives and and growing up too right what, yeah. what inspires you um yeah. what, what's your thought on audiobooks do oh, you love, I, I know you've got some and it's someone else narrating them for you but do you love them do you hate them are they are you would prefer people to pick up and go to bed with this great book Oh, I mean, I think, you know, I always support my, you know, my readers and however, however they want to read, you know, you really can't, like I, the, the narrator for this book and my last few books, Vivian Lahaney is like an amazing narrator, you know, people who have been listening to her just absolutely love her narration of my work. And I had an opportunity to meet her and we're like now we're social media besties and and all that and she's um she's amazing uh she's in she's an amazing talent like that's not i mean that's a specialized talent i know some people do you read their own books like some authors do you read their own books i don't know that i would ever i've never been asked <laughs> but i i don't know that i ever i don't know that i ever would um but i think you know i i think people have have really turned to audiobooks in a new way um, in the last couple of years, like the, you know, just anecdotally, you know, just way more people are buying audiobooks. And I think it might have to do with podcasts. Yeah. I think people really love podcasts and like it's opened like a new kind of way for people to just, you know, and people are so glued to their screen all the time you know during the pandemic I think it's just a way to like give your eyes a break to give your brain a break to like listen to an audiobook while you're doing the laundry or exercising or doing whatever I, I think it's great I think if people want to get their you know get their stories that way like I'm all for it all right I'm just going to take a quick look at the screen here and see if we have some questions for you um, all right, this one is from Melissa. She's being absolutely thrilled that uh, you are here in Kitchener. Just love your books. Do you have um, any published work short stories before your first novel that you would like to share? I actually have very recently um, fallen in love with the form of the short story. So I've written more short stories in the last two years than I have, writ than I have written in my entire career. Um, actually, I have this right, I have this right here. I have this like giant stack of books here. I have, um, so uh, my, my short story, Let Her Be, um, was anthologized in the Best American Mystery and Suspense Stories of 2021. 2021 right that's the year and so um that uh so that's a um that's an a short story that came out originally um I think a year before last and it was uh chosen for inclusion in this anthology um I wrote a short story called the sleep sleep tight motel um that's uh, available um on uh on Amazon and um, I've written for a number of other anthologies um, pretty, uh, pretty recently, like a Tampa Bay Noir is one that I was included in. I was included in the MWA anthology earlier this year. Um, and actually, if you, um, I have a short story that is called The 20 that is free to anybody who signs up for my, for my newsletter. So, and that can be found at lisaunger.com. So yeah, I do have a lot, I do have quite a, quite a, um, quite a lot of short fiction out there. Sarah who, has weighed in as well. She says, are there any books you've read or referred to about the craft of writing? Oh, There's yeah. a writing question. Absolutely. Yes. And I have a number of, I have three, well, I have more than that, but my fate, my really important books on writing are on writing. Uh, by Stephen King. That is an excellent book about not just craft, but about the writing life, um, warts and all. You know, he is really, you know, very candid about his career and his struggles with addiction and his struggles with the page. And it's a fascinating book on every level um, for craft, just purely for craft, but also, you know, about the writing life and more like a philosophical work is Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott. Um, that's a, that's the book that I, you know, it's one of those books that, you know, when I'm stuck or I'm like, 
wondering what comes next or need some inspiration. Like I just open it to any random page. And I feel like if I open it to that, whatever page, like that, whatever advice I need is there. Like it's one of those kinds of, what kind, one of those kinds of books. Um, another book that I always recommend for aspiring writers, people who, um, you know, like think they want to write, but they don't know how to connect to that writer self is a book called The Artist's Way by yeah. Julia Cameron. And it's really more like a class. It's like, you know, the book is a class pretty much. And it, you know, connects you to your writer self by, you know, giving you exercises like the morning pages, which is like, just get up and write whatever it is. It doesn't have to be anything except just a stream of consciousness writing or taking yourself on artist dates that like connect you to like that creative self, um, you know, by getting in touch with somebody else's creativity. And then there's another book called by John DeFriends called, uh, it's called The Lie That Tells the Truth. And it is a very, it's an excellent book on craft. Like anything you kind of want to know about, you know, just being a better writer is, is in there. And so those are all books that I highly recommend for writers. I'll, I'll write those all down later and share them on social media. Yeah. Um, we are very close to Halloween. Oh, yes. And a question from another viewer joining us tonight. Since it is spooky season, can you recommend a few great scary horror stories? And I wonder if that ties into Stephen King as well. Yes, I, I have. I just wrote a whole, I <laughs> just wrote a great, an essay about horror, horror books that have inspired me. And I'm like immediately, like, of course, completely drawing a blank right now. But I will say that, um, so any really anything Stephen King is like you know is going to get you in touch with your spooky self I mean there are so many and there are so many great Stephen King books that like are not the iconic classics um like Bag of Bones is a Stephen King book that I always recommend for um, anybody who doesn't realize that he's just a spectacular writer it's not just you know it's not just a, not just that he's the master of horror he's also you know a spectacular writer um, weirdly enough, I just, um, I just reread, uh, Rosemary's Baby oh. by Ira Levin. And I was like, God, it's perfect. It's perfect in every way. Like as a novel, it's so good. It's so scary. It's so psychological. And I can't believe it just completely still stands up. Um, recently I read a book, uh, oh gosh, I, can somebody tell me the author's name? I know that you're going to be able to type it in as soon as I say it, a Mexican Gothic. It's Sylvia Moreno, um, Garcia, can you help us? I think, I, I think know. this one, I, I, there is, if you Google Lisa Unger, crime reads, horror novels, like a whole essay will come up. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to think of what are my other like super scary, super scary books um, that I that I absolutely love. I mean, I guess you can always go back to, you know, Peter Straub, you know, ghost story. Um, there's I mean, there's so many and I, I have been a huge like sort of horror. Oh, of course, uh, The Haunting of Hill House. You know, that is a that is an epic Amitable horror. Yeah, Amityville Horror. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, The Haunting of Hill House is actually what inspired um my collection of short stories that I did for uh for Amazon original stories called The House of Crows. And so it was like that was the inspiration for those short short stories that I I wrote. But that again, another like classic book that you just go back to again and again. So yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of really good, and there's a lot of good like modern horror novels out there as well. Um, one more question before we start to wrap things up here um, from Melissa. Do you have a story tucked away somewhere that you continue to go back to or will never, ever see the light of day? I do. do. Something under I the do. couch right now? I do, have so I do have something that I continue to go back to. I don't know what's going to, I don't know what's going to happen to it. I, I kind of revisit it and 
you know, it kind of progresses in this really slow way on the back burner. You know, it's like there's always seems to be like a bigger voice or a more urgent story that needs to be told. But this this one just kind of hovers in the back in the background. And so I keep going back to it and I figure at some there's going to be a moment when it's like it's time just for just for that. So I'll keep you posted. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll officially hand it back to Sheila in just a moment, but Lisa, it's been wonderful getting to know you a little bit more than our fast friendship on yes. uh, Instagram. Uh, I have a lot more reading to do. This is, by the way, book number 19. It is. So I have a whole lot of time to be spending with you before I'm back on Instagram with you. Yes. But, um, this was a thriller. It was. I, I went along for the whole ride mm -hmm. and um, we can't talk about the ending, but I'm telling you, it was everything that I needed to have happen oh, and I'm wrap so it up and it. feel I'd love to hear that of course you know I can't say much more right because it, <laughs> I want people to read it as well and congratulations on all those new successes with this book in just a few weeks how many lists you're popping up on thank as you, well thank so, you. so thank nice. you for joining us tonight wonderful to officially meet you and um Please include me in that League of Leases one day that you were talking about. I absolutely will. You're moderating the next League of Leases. Yeah. Okay. I, pro I absolutely 100% promise because a lot of leases got left out. Mm -hmm. Like Lisa Jewel was like, hello, you know, what about me? I was like, oh my God, there's, <laughs> there's so many leases. And I know other people are going to start copying me too. So with their, with their own names, I think the other one was Katrina, somebody who was like going to do a league of Katrina's. I was like, okay, go for it. You know, I support you. <laughs> well, thank you. It's, it's been a joy to chat with you tonight and I can't wait to read your other works and to see that big announcement that maybe I'll get the scoop to first maybe about you get, you get maybe the, a movie. I'll DM you. I'll DM okay. you. Insta, like a cool, like, like the cool kids do. The cool kids do. Thank you. We'll hand it over to Sheila now. Thank you again, Lisa. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you for everything. Ladies, thank you. That was wonderful. I uh, appreciate your time tonight. Lisa Unger, thank you so much for taking the time to visit us in Kitchener. And while we can't, we can't wait until we can get back to in-person events and book signings, Zoom has allowed us to welcome you to our region. And I know you've started some of your in-person book launches and hybrid events in the States. So I wish you all the best as you share your book with the readers. Thank and with you. your, your, thank you. And with your next books, when you do begin to travel again internationally, and if you find yourself doing a launch in Canada, we're only a two hour drive from Buffalo border. <laughs> and we would love to welcome you to our library and to our theater at any time. I can't wait, I, I'm in for sure. Thank you, that would be great. <laughs> Lisa Drew, thank you for again supporting our library and for our 85 Queen Author events. And thank you for being an important part in our community and a voice to wake up to. And for trying your hardest to get that info we all want about future possibilities of Lisa's stories turning into movies. I tried, Sheila. Films. I know. <laughs> thank you so much. It's appreciated. Thanks so much, You're ladies. Good. And to tonight's audience, we thank you for choosing to spend some of your evening with us and for your questions. One lucky viewer will receive a copy of Lisa's book. We will contact that winner by email tomorrow. And thanks as well to Alice Tibbetts and the team at HarperCollins Canada for their ongoing support of author book launches at Kitchener Public Library. And of course, Wordsworth Books. We appreciate their ongoing support of all of our author events. Copies of Last Girl Ghosted are in stock and they're kindly offering a discount if you mention attending this event. Thanks to each of you for being here tonight with us. Have a great week and see you soon.